in, in, in a lot of countries in the West, the dealing with your waste is you're kind of separated from that. You're, you're, you put it in the bin and it magically disappears. Someone comes, it's all arranged for you. You don't have to think about it. And here you have to make that extra effort because there really isn't a system. So you have, to, you have to think about it. You're confronted with it. So even though there's a really bad problem, there's a positive side because you're forced to, to recognize the problem. You're forced to have to deal with it. So, you know, looking at that side, it's really an opportunity for people to, to kind of confront their, <laughs> their consumption, their pollution. Bali has a problem about the, every year, our coastal in the season, one is a year, uh, a lot of plastic garbage like uh, landed in, in Kuta coastal. Uh, the government said, oh yeah, this is because of the uh, sea, sea tide, you know. It's not about the sea tide for my opinion, it's about the people still throw plastic garbage in the river or in the canal and then they flow to the ocean and then the ocean will bring it back to the land. Waste management is a little bit the land of no one, no? I mean, it's a little bit, you can almost do whatever you want without really being caught. But the garbage problem affects everybody, rich and poor. And if you can't deal with that basic problem of uh, pollution from your waste, then how are you going to deal with these larger, more complex problems like deforestation and you know, uh, destruction of the coral reef and climate change? I mean, it's like, it's like the easy one to handle. If we're talking about a garbage problem in Bali, uh, for my perspective, yeah, it, it's, you can debate about it. But uh, actually, it's like uh, the original culture or people in Bali here, they, they really clean yeah, in their house. Yeah? Uh, they wake up in the morning like uh, 5 o'clock early and then already uh, clean their house, clean their yard and at the before sunset also they're doing the same things, they clean it and then they throw all the garbage into the the the, the area in the house hold is called Tegalan. It's mean like uh, just the area that you plant or grow anything or you uh, grow a pig there or something. There is a special area to uh, to put this garbage. 
But a long, long t time ago, let's say like uh, 25 or 30 years ago, most of this garbage are organic. So, uh, and the Balinese, most of the Balinese, still doing this culture. Only the the material of the garbage is changed. Now it's plastic. Waste is a man-made concept. It doesn't really, it didn't really exist, and especially didn't exist before. Um, you know, the 50s and 60s, everything was organic. You didn't have all this man-made material. Mostly things would have been packaged in banana leaves. So if you look at offerings, your daily offerings, which can be bought at the market, um, they're now being pa packaged in plastic bags, single use, very thin, um, high density plastic that's used once and thrown away because it's so thin that you can't really reuse it. That would have all been packaged in banana leaves. Um, but I also think that probably what's happened is a change of lifestyle. Um, food also would have been packaged in banana leaves. A change of lifestyle so that now um, there's a lot more things available on the market. In the past, I don't think offerings, for instance, as an example, would have been so widely sold as they are nowadays. But so many people are working directly or indirectly in the tourist industry so that you know, increasingly people are having to buy things which in the past they wouldn't have had to buy. There really wasn't the culture of obsolescence that exists today. Traditionally in, in Indonesia and, and also Bali, of course, uh, most people don't uh, want to pay for waste disposal. I mean, they never had it. What they did with their waste was just throw it in the back or burn it or throw it in the river. Mm -hmm. And those habits spill over into businesses. People have their restaurant or they have their hotel and they take the same approach. They just get it away, get it away. And they never thought about having to pay for this. It's always, you can just throw it on the open lot or throw it in the river and it's taken care of. And it's further complicated now in that you know, you have a lot of um, uh, large hotels that produce a hu huge amount of waste, and there's actually a lot of valuable stuff in that waste. And you have an informal scavenging sector that approach the hotels and businesses and say, we will provide waste service for you for free. They will buy the waste. And what they're really interested in, not actually buying the waste, they're buying access to the recyclables. So they're taking the stuff of value, but the stuff that has no value, guess where it goes? In the river, on the side of the road, wherever. You really get what you pay for. If you're selling your waste or paying very little, you're going to have a dirty island. And for the tourism sector, obviously it's in their interest not to have a dirty island. So they have to make that leap and start realizing that if they want to have this thing taken care of, the stuff that doesn't have value, they're going to have to pay for it. Also another problem that we have in Bali is that plastic waste is often burnt. And this can create all sorts of problems. I mean, respiratory, respiratory illnesses are the number one reported illness in Bali and if you're breathing in uh, plastic waste that's being burnt particularly at the the speed that it's being burnt because uh, it's not a high heat burning which is less toxic but it's, a, it's usually a smoldering slow burning heap so that this can create all sorts of problems for human health and air quality. I mean think of all these things we have that are really pointless. I mean, a plastic bag you use for 15 minutes and then it's around for your grandkids and their grandkids. It's just insane. And it's not just plastic bags. There's so many things you look around from plastic straws to, you know, plastic bottles. I mean, the idea that a plastic bottle consumes, uh, you know, a typical 600 milliliter plastic bottle needs uh, a, th a quarter of it in oil uh, to produce that bottle is just mind-boggling. I mean, when you're looking at that plastic bottle, you're not buying water, you're buying crude oil. <laughs> uh, and then in, in Bali, people don't realize how many bottles there are. There are just water bottles. There are over three million bottles a day, and that doesn't include all the other kind of beverages from you know your soda to your energy drinks and things like that. And even if you were able to recycle 90% of those, you would still have you know, 300,000 of them in being thrown in the environment every day. It's not acceptable. It's nonsense. In Bali, we produce 20,000 cubic meters of waste every day. And if we say that 15% of that is plastic, 
then that means we're producing 3,000 cubic metres of plastic waste every day. I think that it's an incredibly valuable resource. It's mined, um, oil is, is drilled from the ground and it creates this product which is incredibly useful. So it should be rightly respected as a resource and used and used and reused and reused again and again and again. Our, our argument as a campaign is not with plastic, it's, it's about our consumption and our, our habits around this disposable culture that we've created. I mean, people come to Bali and, and um, you know, they've looked at the brochure, they've heard about it or read about it, seen stuff, and they have these, these, this image of what Bali is. And um, there's been a few times where, where they've been quite um, shocked of what happened and what actually is the situation. There is a story where I was asked to help with this hotel. They, they had had a, a problem with garbage that right in front of their hotel entrance, literally, there was a huge garbage dump and it would burn almost every day and the smoke would go right through um, the hotel's lobby and through their restaurant and through the beach and it wasn't good for business as you might suspect so they didn't they had tried every you know they'd called every government office i think even calling up to the governor to help deal with this problem and nothing ever happened and so out of desperation they asked for help and went down there and did a quick little survey and they you know we were, i was working for an ngo back then and they they were willing to pay us to do it, and uh, at the time we thought quite a bit. Uh, if we knew how much money they were losing, we would ask for more. But we did um, a survey of what was going on, and what we discovered is most of the garbage burning in front of their hotel was their own, that they had created their own problem. And why that happened was they were selling their garbage to the local trash guy. And he was just taking what he wanted out of it and dumping everything in the traditional dump. In fact, the dump had been there before the hotel. And so no one in the hotel had bothered to cross the street and look, and they would have seen their logo, and they would have seen it. And their reaction at first was, well, let's fire this guy and get rid of him. They, and they said, no, that's not going to work. I mean, you replace him, it's going to be the same thing. The problem is not this guy dumping here. The problem is you're asking him to pay for this, uh, the garbage. It's you're, you should be paying him to, dump, to take care of it properly, to dump it at the landfill. A novel idea, oh my god. I mean, they really were kind of accustomed to selling their garbage. It's completely crazy. And they, they realized um, uh, that they needed to change, and it was easy to make the decision because they were losing um, tens of thousands of dollars a day. I mean, they were losing a lot of money. So to switch over and pay a local guy a few hundred dollars a month to take care of it made a lot of sense. So every year Bali has, I think it's 4 million domestic tourists and 3 million international tourists. Now on top of that we have a population that's just about reached 4 million. So you think of that in terms of the resources that every tourist uses, and it's estimated that a tourist will consume four times the amount of, your, of an average local person. What's happening with all the rubbish that they're producing? There might be a dump nearby that's in a river that's going out the ocean. You're wondering why all this garbage is in the ocean. It might be coming from the places you're, you're um, staying or, you know, eating at. One of, one of the main proponents against the illegal dumping was always saying, you know, they, they make the money in Ubud and we get the trash. You know, it just maybe it's the, the location of it and also the agreement and acceptance of the the past decision makers to allow the, the trash to come in. So they said, oh great, we have a place and there's an agreement and look, you know, our trash is actually helping you to build a road that's going to um, connect it to land that was otherwise inaccessible. So I truly believe that they, they felt that there was a mutual benefit exchange happening. And it only was until recent that they realized, okay, you know, maybe, maybe this deal isn't so good and, you know, put a, put a stop to it. And the, the Kapala Dessa, the head of the village, was actually able to implement that and, and endorse it and, yeah, make it happen. I think Bali government already made a roadmap Bali Go Clean and Green, yeah? It's like uh, the big agenda in our government, how to make it Bali more sustainable, more eco, more green, you know? Actually, if we, we see the, 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 the roadmap, it's already good. I mean, the short-term planning, the, the medium-term planning, and the long-term planning is already good. Uh, and then the, the, the policy of this, this, what is this, this planning is 
based on the three big main agenda. First, education, formal or informal. And then the second, involve the private sector. I mean like this, uh, like company or all the corporate that make business in Bali because, yeah, tourism is the most, the main business also, but also the, 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 the garbage or the, the pollution is also made by this big industry. And the third is, uh, involve the the people action i mean the, the 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 community action there's actually a lot of people out there that are concerned about the problem but they don't know what to do and they're completely you know frustrated with it and when you start setting these examples they see that and then they they come to you and that's what's happening i believe that lots of uh, grassroots movement in bali based on uh, made by ngos or made by uh, just uh, social local organization already make a good movement about uh, and make awareness to the locals to the how 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 to spirit it spirit the garbage and how to uh, make a compost from the organic garbage uh, but uh, right now from my perspective it's just like a small movement so I think to make it effective yeah we should involve or make a social pressure to the government to make a local law like Perda or Awik Awik to make it more uh, significant, to make it more significant change, I mean, to make a more effective and efficient. We consulted with the community leaders and we heard that, you know, they have big plans for their village to try and revitalize their economy here um, with a, a cultural and ecotourism program that just got launched about a year and a half ago. In addition to helping them to kind of formulate their, their tourism program, because they asked us for some advice um, from a, a foreigner perspective, uh, we also gave advice on the, the waste management stuff, which the community had been working on for, some members of the community had been working on for 15 years, because this illegal dump site started about 15 years ago. And there's been people in the community that have, you know, protested against it since then. Um, and coincidentally, about, you know, a year after we, we started the project in this community, the illegal dump site had been shut down after 15 years of operating, which is, for us, it felt like a monumental success for the village to achieve that. It was really, like, quite a big deal. I mean, there's still, it's not perfect right now because it's, you know, the waste still has to be handled, but the decision to stop the incoming 14 trucks a day of waste from outside of this village, it's not even theirs, was a huge decision um, that we felt really proud of, of the people being able to achieve that. Uh, I, I definitely think it could be replicated in other villages. Um, of course, the, the joint shared vision and desire has to be there. Many times people kind of throw their hands in and uh, what am I going to do? But there are actually a lot of things you can do and you have to start um, s maybe small in the beginning, but you have to start. If you have small organic farm or organic uh, farm in your house, even a small one, it will be effectively decrease the, the, the garbage problem. For example, like, like, like my kitchen waste, yeah? Uh, more or less like uh, 70% are organic. So I have a compost box. I just put the 70% of organic into the compost because this will be back again to the nature, you know, back again to my vegetable plot. And then the rest 30%, uh, most of this 30% non-organic non garbage is recyclable. So, and has an economic value too, because in Bali we have pemulung. Pemulung is like a, the garbage collector. So they, they sometimes they buy it from you, from every house. It's like a, they will uh, traveling around. Barang bekas, barang bekas mean, means like a, a garbage, garbage. And then they will buy it. They have like a really good value for plastic, for bottle, like a beer bottle, for paper, for uh, aluminium, metal steel, copper, they have a really, really good, good price to buy it from the people. So, and mostly, most of 
this 30% non organic garbage from my kitchen is recyclable. So you can sell it to the, or just give it to the, this garbage collector. So, and this 25% will be, will be going to re recycle, to be something good, uh, new goods. And so only this 5% is, is, is your actual garbage, what we call it, like a really garbage. This is like uh, the, the soft plastic material, like a uh, biscuit, uh, kemasan, biscuit packaging, or plastic bag. So for my opinion, opinion, if this only 5% garbage going to the dumping place, because we cannot doing anything with it, I think the, dump, the dump, dumping place is not so full so quickly. So I think the most practical way now that uh, we in Bali doesn't have a waste management facility yet, the proper one is to do waste prevention. Each household can do that, like bringing your own bag, bringing your own container, bringing your own bottle. So you don't um, add more waste. I know it looks just small, but it's only one plastic bag. But, well, um, I worked with a group of students once, and we asked them to observe how many plastic bags enter their household each. And one student came and said, five plastic bags. Okay, let's calculate. In a month, that will be 150. And how many people, how many family, more or less in your banjar, she said 55. That means in a year, it will be like more than 10,000 plastic bags. That's a lot. This happened to me because uh, when we're talking about plastic, for example, like uh, the big problem in Bali, I try to live like a one month uh, plastic diet, we call it plastic diet, and then uh, just to get uh, the the data about how difficult to to live without uh, to live uh, with as minimize as much as possible using plastic uh, it, it, it can be made you know you, like uh, we go shopping we just bring our own bag own bag on carrier so yeah it's not so difficult about it for most of our customers, we provide them with a monthly recycling report. So they get a sheet of paper that says, okay, these are the things that you were able to recycle. This much aluminum, this much uh, uh, plastic bottles, this much of this other plastic, paper, blah, blah, blah. And then we go down the list of other things that, that um, were man-made but weren't recyclable. They're, you know, styrofoam or, you know, some hazardous stuff. And then we go down into organics and explain to them the food waste we collected and all that. So they have a record of what actually they're producing. And at first, you know, they're like, oh, that's cute, that's nice, whatever. But after a while, when they look back and they see over six months or a year, they realize actually how much waste they produce. And in some cases, it's quite shocking. So it's kind of a wake-up call, and it makes them realize that, yes, they are polluters. You know, they have to think about their impacts. I think tourists have an enormous responsibility for the impacts that they create on any country that, that they visit they contribute a huge amount to the amount of waste that needs to be dealt with. Um, so, you know, they can make an, a positive impact by perhaps the hotels that they choose to stay at, making sure, asking, okay, what's your environmental policy? What, what do you do with your waste? You know, I want to make sure that the waste that I'm creating at this hotel or what the hotel is creating is ending up at the right place, not going and polluting the rivers and going into the ocean and actually degrading the whole tourist experience. Like the whole point of you know, going to a place for a holiday, a nice holiday is to relax, maybe enjoy the sea, but if there's a bunch of trash in it, then obviously it's not, it's not really what you came here for. So you can ask your hotel what they do with their stuff. You can, um, before coming here, make a pledge to support a local organization that's maybe working to support the environment, to keep the place that you're coming to visit beautiful and functioning. Um, and you can donate to those organizations, those nonprofits, um, and support projects like that. Um, and yeah, on a on a larger scale, I would I would like to see um, the the places, the tourist destinations, perhaps saying that you know one percent of money that you spend on hotel or food or airline tickets goes to supporting an environmental fund or like a green fund. There's places that have done that effectively, like um, Gili Trangan off the coast of Lombok have uh, the, the Gili Eco Trust. So 
you know, just a small amount. I think it's like a dollar a day per tourist goes to that fund, and that helps to do the waste management and different, addresses different environmental issues. Everyone wants to be green. And basically the first phase of that is you have some pioneers that are, that are being green and then everyone jumps on the bandwagon and say they're green. And more often than not, unfortunately, a lot of people are just saying they're green. They, they, they might have good intentions or they might not, but it's just a marketing element. And they say, we're green or we recycle, we do that. But as people, as um, customers and people understand that it's, it's not enough just to say they have to kind of prove it, they have to explain what they do. And even, you know, just asking questions and that and, and Heads up, it helps. At the top of any waste management plan should always be prevention first, then reduction. And then you start looking at, okay, well the waste is already there, what can we do with it? Can we reuse it? Okay, if we can't reuse it, can we recycle it? But it's, it's got to be in that pyramid of priorities. So what the coalition are doing right now is to encourage business to do waste prevention, we call it Plastic Detox Bali, our community right now. People right now are addicted to plastic. They tend to be like freak out like, what? No plastic allowed? Like, we have to keep reminding them we're not anti-plastic, we need plastic, but you, ne you need to learn how to use it wisely. So, uh, to help them ease this addiction. <laughs> I guess like Plastic Detox Bali, so there's a, a series of action that business can can pick, like first, we ask them not to provide a plastic bag for free. What I think should be done on, on Bali, and perhaps in the rest of Indonesia, but certainly on Bali, is first introduce a bag tax. Make people pay for it. Pay for the plastic bag, pay for the privilege pay for the mounting external costs because then hopefully people will realize this is not free. People think it's free now and they think it's modern. They think free, modernity, nice, yeah, asik dong, but it's not because what about the cost of cleaning it up over the long term? What about the health costs incurred by people who inhale the dioxins created by burning it? What about the people who eat it in their fish? What, is, what are the public health costs? You know, all these costs, and we're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. And then, so you want to make waste management or you want to do waste reduction? Which one is more cost efficient? Yeah, cost effective. For a government that's struggling, that can't even provide water to the residents in Denpasar, you know, there's so many other crises that are impending on this island. You know, plastic should be the easiest thing. Just put a bag tax. And then when people already realize there's already public support, hey, bags are expensive, then you do a bag ban. Ban it. Ban the single-use plastic bag. Ireland, 92% reduction in two weeks. They just banned it outright. And it, it, it's possible in a place like Bali. It's an island. I mean, you could just ban the bag. And people would just have to learn to deal with it. You learn. The first or second time you go to the store and you don't have a bag and you're, you know, you're either forced to buy a bag or you got to go home and get one, you won't forget again. You know, instant behavior shift. Instant. And people will grumble and mm -ya, mm -ya, mm -ya, but grow up. We have to be in adults about the environment we live in. Students are the, the next leaders to come in the very new, near future. So they need to be able to have access to the kind of information and education to be made aware. Um, and you know, oftentimes, not just in Indonesia, but in many countries, the school curriculum is outdated. It's not relevant to the current issues that we're facing in modern times. So to be able to infuse the perhaps outdated or has room to grow curriculum, um, we feel that, that would be really effective and, and get the kids excited. We started to select school in different area. Many of them were in a little bit more remote areas where they didn't really have any uh, collection service. So typically the school would be burning the, the, the waste or throwing in the river on the back. We had very good discussion in a, in, a, in a high school in which without wanting to, you know, say what was the solution, we were asking what do you think should be done in terms, what, what can you do to reduce waste if you, in, in, your, in your daily situation? And without having to say anything, and because the, we had refreshments around that was served by the school, students went straight away, well, this we can 
take away this, we can reintroduce the, you know, banana leaf, this, you know, don't use that and that. So it's a way, I think, I think actually the high schools are, are, should be a pretty good target. A lot of programs, they don't need a lot of money, but they need some. And if you could help to, in the fundraising efforts for getting these programs off the ground and or sustaining them, it would be a huge, huge help. You know, when you think about it on that global scale, what will future communities do? The solution for me, yeah, it's back again to the, <laughs> to the government, because the, the, the people, most of the people here already agree about the, about the, some like a, the garbage separation or the recycle, all the, all the slogan that made like a re reuse, recycle, uh, reuse, or Bali go clean and green. Everything already agree about that slogan, right? But what we're talking now is, after the slogan or after the, 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 what is the idea, something that you wrote, the words, you have to do the action right now, right? So what we're waiting for now, we as the grassroots movement or the people still doing it, what we believe in, but what we, we're waiting is like a, the government law to support this action. To institute that change on such a massive scale, wow, I mean, that's what the government needs to intervene. And it needs to intervene from the top all the way down to the village. Every level, you know, and, and the way with regional autonomy in Indonesia, it, it, yeah, the governor can say it should be like this, but then the Vupatis need to follow suit. They need to care. They need to really care. I think now the government still have no serious concern about the garbage, but I do believe if the government, the Balinese, especially the, the Balinese local government, because gov uh, government in Bali is quite unique, yeah? we have like a formal government and informal government and they both seem strong, 50-50. So this, this, this both government make a really serious concern about, about the garbage or waste issue. It will be uh, socialized effectively in the public. We people here will be support 100%, so make it real. Tolak tas kresek, tolak tas kresek, 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 tolak tas kresek. Bali ini pulau yang cantik, tas kresek bikin kulitnya bersisik. Ayo kita mainkan musik, dukung Bali cantik tanpa plastik.